Designed, Deconstructed, Mental Health and Wellness with Dr. Kaz and George. The statements of Dr. Kaz and George are not a substitute for medical care, and our opinions are our own. If you are experiencing a mental health emergency, please seek assistance from a professional in your area. You can contact us via Twitter at Mind Deconstruct. I'm your host, George. With me is Dr. Kaz. Dr. Kaz Nelson is an American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology Certified Psychiatrist, licensed to practice medicine in the state of Minnesota, and an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Today on our podcast, what's the deal with psychotherapy? Thanks for asking that question, George. Did I get there already? What's the deal with psychotherapy? That's right. It's this very mystifying thing, right? You know, we watch a lot of TV, movies, and there might be somebody laying on a couch, and then a gentleman with a beard with a clipboard, strike, stroking his beard and saying, tell me more. And there's this, you know, image in the media that that's what psychotherapy is. And that's certainly the image that I had when I was in college and as a medical student. And so I thought we could spend a little bit of time today demystifying psychotherapy, saying what it is, saying what it's not, and busting any myths that might be existing. So did Freud, is that is it all about Freud? Is psychotherapy all about Freud? Well, originally it was. Freud was the original psychotherapist and actually the original psychiatrist. He started his training as a neurologist when there were no psychiatrists. And he found that as he had in-depth discussion and time spent with people experiencing unusual neurologic symptoms, he got to understand a lot about people, a lot about what makes people tick, and a lot about what leads to functional recovery. And he came up with some pretty amazing theories back in the early 1900s. Is everything a penis? <laughs> you know, some of the theories he came up with pre- pretty interesting, related back to base things that make people tick, sexuality, sexual drive being one of them. And if you read Freud and a lot of Freud's early work, there is a lot of sexual stuff in there. Uh, and that's what his patients were talking about at the time for a variety of reasons. And so that's what he based a lot of his theories on. So how do we get to modern psychotherapy from Freud? Yes, a lot has happened between then and now. We give Freud and his work his props that are due, and there's actually some people who still practice the type of psychotherapy that Freud did. It's called psychoanalysis, and there's psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic rather institutes around the country that train people in psychoanalytic theory and practice. But I would say that most psychiatrists and most psychotherapists are not being trained in psychoanalysis like Freud practiced back in the day. They're doing other uh, more, I think we could say, modern techniques. Why psychotherapy and what does it get a person? Good question. So It's a good question. Of course it's a good question. It's a damn good question. How about that? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things that medications can help, and we've certainly come a long way in understanding certain receptors in the brain and biological functioning of the brain. But there's a lot of things that impact people that aren't particularly well treated with medications and have more to do with lessons learned early in life or at different times during life that need to be understood, excuse me, understood better and relearned in order to reach full functional recovery. And that's where psychotherapy comes in. What, what am I relearning? Like, why would I say I need to go get some psychotherapy? Well, one of the more basic reasons why somebody would need psychotherapy is support for something they are going through. Whether it's an adjustment, like going to college and struggling with adjustment to college, struggling with the difficulty of a new relationship, struggling with grief related to the loss of a loved one. Everybody can use support for that from time to time. And as you know, talking to a friend can be supportive, but sometimes friends want to fix your problems or don't know what to say or unsure how to help. And so going to a therapist, particularly somebody who might be practicing supportive psychotherapy, might help with some of those times of difficulty. I I just picked up on one thing here. We're talking about psychotherapy. Is that the same thing as therapy? you know, I'm going to therapy, like I'm, is that it? Yeah, it's a good time to visit the terminology here. So psychotherapy or therapy or talking therapy 
all probably mean the same thing. And that's an umbrella term for different types of psychotherapy that are practiced. So back when I mentioned Freud, the work that he did is a certain type of therapy called psychoanalysis. And that's a really important point because back when I was a medical student, I thought psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, I thought those terms meant the same thing. And so when somebody was suggesting that a patient get psychotherapy, I thought, gosh, isn't that kind of old fashioned? Or don't we have medicines now to help with that? Why are we still doing this psychotherapy thing that Freud did? But I think what it's important, what it, what's important to understand is that there's different types of therapy now. They've been studied very well, so that there's an evidence base behind them to show that they work. And for different conditions or different things going on, uh, different types of psychotherapy might be exactly what's needed for full recovery. Someone doesn't have to go to a psychiatrist to receive psychotherapy. Correct. There's a lot of psychologists and psychotherapists with varying degrees of training. Some are licensed social workers. Some have master's degrees in counseling that can offer psychotherapy or therapy. Is that, uh, is that, is that licensed? I mean, who regulates who can provide therapy? And in, in, let's just say Minnesota since we're here. In order to bill for therapy, you have to be a licensed therapist through, in our state, the state of Minnesota. And the state licenses licenses different degrees and has different requirements and criteria for who can be licensed and what's required. So does it boil down to insurance then? I mean, is it an insurance issue that can I can I give someone therapy if I'm not billing an insurance? Or is someone going to come after me? I'm just wondering, if the, is there a board out there? This is the lawyer in you, George. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I would say that if uh, somebody is offering therapy services in an unlicensed manner, they could be at risk. So somebody who's not licensed might want to, you know, there's lots of people out there offering life coaching and other uh, services that are supportive but aren't necessarily therapy. So if you're really seeking therapy, you want to find somebody licensed. So sorry, that's probably the root of it. Find someone licensed, be it a licensed social worker or licensed therapist or licensed psychiatrist or psychologist, all those things all should maybe have the word licensed in front of them. That's my preference, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, that's probably a good if thing. If you're seeking psychotherapy, yes. If you're looking for a driver, maybe a licensed driver. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> that's a good way to think about it. Good idea. The, but there's still different kinds of therapy. even though, right. there, So there's different people providing therapy. There's also different kinds of therapy. Right. And I think in this period of time together, I'm going to tell you about the four most commonly practiced types of psychotherapy. So the first one I already alluded to, that's supportive psychotherapy. This is the kind of therapy that's probably being offered at your neighborhood counseling center, a college counseling center. Uh, It's very common. It's commonly paid for by insurance. And that's somebody that you meet with that basically walks through your life with you in a non-judgmental and supportive way and helps you meet your goals. There's not a manual associated with it. It's not like there's different rules where the first session you do this or that. And so there's a little bit more art involved with the practice of supportive psychotherapy because it depends a lot on the practitioner. But the general theme is they're there to help you function better and to help support you through your symptom recovery. And a lot of people find this to be extremely helpful for periods of anxiety, periods of depression, adjustment, and grief. Okay, so let's let's hear let's hear all four of them, and then I've got some questions. Sure. So the four I wanted to tell you about today: the first one was supportive psychotherapy, and then psychodynamic psychotherapy, and then two different types of behavioral therapy: one called cognitive behavior therapy, and another called dialectical behavior therapy. Referred to as DBT. Oftentimes, I've heard DBT. Yep, CBT and DBT are the acronyms there. Oh, so CBT and DBT are different things. Yep. They're different types of behavioral therapies. Oh, fun. Okay. I do. I said I wanted to hear all four, but now I want to jump back to supportive psychotherapy again. Does a supportive psychotherapist need to have their life put together in order to tell me how to live my life? Or are they telling me how to live my life? What are they doing? Well, in general, they shouldn't be giving too much advice or telling you what to do but rather supporting you with your goals and helping you explore different ways of 
acting or different paths you can take and helping you choose the right one that's best for you. And we have a general rule in therapy that you should be mentally healthier than your patient uh, or your client. Uh, And so uh, in a sense, no one has their life put together or is operating perfectly, but we do take our own mental health very seriously and we need to be in a position to assist and be supportive for other people. And so, yes, there is an impetus on mental health and healthy coping in therapists. Are there people who supportive psychotherapy is wrong for? Because if I'm a really poor decision maker and all this person is going to do is kind of support me, is that a, is that a good idea? Well, it depends on what you have access to. So if you're living in rural Minnesota, and the only people in town practice supportive psychotherapy, that might be your only choice. But there's other types of therapy that are more specific to different things that might be going on. And I'll tell you about the other therapies. And it may be that depending on what's going on, a different type of therapy might be an even better fit to help you meet your goals. So number two was psychodynamic? Yes. Psychodynamic psychotherapy is a modern therapy that's more closely related to Freud and his work and what he did with the goal of cultivating insight about oneself and how one's functioning with the emphasis on formative or childhood experiences. And so when somebody engages in psychodynamic psychotherapy, they're really understanding their life story and their life journey and the things that have impacted them, the things that they've maybe been endured or been exposed to over time and helping help understand themselves through using that as it applies to their current context. So for example, it could be in psychodynamic psychotherapy, the therapist brings up the idea that your parents divorced when you were five years old, and you wonder together about perhaps, is that impacting your capacity to engage in healthy relationships at this point in your adult life? And so that's just an example, but there's uh, many other ways of understanding oneself, but it tends to be quite in depth. And for really highly functioning people looking at taking their functioning to an even higher level through in-depth understanding of their life story. Is there more, is that kind of, is this the couch one where you're going to be laying on a couch talking about your childhood? Well, uh, some psychodynamic psychotherapists would want you to kind of relax by laying on a couch, but that's more of a practice associated with Freud's psychoanalysis. So a psychodynamic psychotherapist might have you in a chair or they might have you in a couch, probably more commonly in a chair, but some, some have different preferences. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty high level stuff. So this might not be the right therapy for somebody who's actively suicidal or uh, having a lot of issues with psychosis at the moment uh, because it tends to be pretty hard work and stressful in some ways, understanding these things and how your life story impacts you. And so generally, some degree of stability is good uh, as you take on something like psychodynamic psychotherapy, but it can be extremely helpful and fruitful for those who undergo this type of treatment. Okay, so then cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive means the mind, right? Correct. That thing yes. Can, yeah, yeah. And yes, then beha- behavioral therapy. So it's the mind's behavior therapy. Is that what we got <laughs> I think here? you're onto yeah, something there, there George. I, I like I like your moxie. Uh, so the next two I'll talk about both have the terms behavior therapy in their title, and that's a clue that they come from a similar tradition. So a little bit after Freud in the 1950, the behavior therapist came on the scene, and thought that rather than insight and reflection and those kinds of things that Freud was advocating, mental health symptoms were due mainly to behaviors and the kinds of things in your environment that we're punishing and rewarding. So in the same way, you can sort of train a dog to not jump on the couch by punishing it and giving it treats when it's, you know, standing in the right place, we could actually treat mental health conditions like depression and anxiety through reward and punishment of different behaviors. And the amazing thing is Freud's approach and the insight-based approaches work, but these behaviorist approaches actually work as well. And so the good thing is whether you're sort of starting from 
the thought or the behavior, all of these approaches tend to support mental health, recovery, and well-being. But over time, it got a little bit more sophisticated. A pure behaviorist would have just worried about what the person is doing in terms of their behavior. But a cognitive behaviorist came around came along a little bit later and said, well, let's consider thoughts as a behavior too. So if someone's sitting around and saying, oh, I'm a worthless person, I'm a worthless person, I don't deserve to be alive, uh, let's frame that as a behavior that they're doing and approach it in the same way. And so cognitive behavior therapy is one of these really neat therapies where it's manualized and there's prescribed activities that happen in each session. And it's actually only... 12 to 15 sessions, and certain disorders like mild to moderate depression, anxiety, symptom, some symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, there's eating disorder protocols for cognitive behavior therapy. There can be substantial symptom recovery based on these protocols in 12 to 15 sessions. Now, it's not without a cost, though, because there's a lot of hard work involved with cognitive behavior therapy. There's a lot of homework. There's a lot of in-between session work. And so this is not the type of therapy that would be good for someone who's hesitant or unsure whether they need therapy because they're going to be given a lot of homework. Um, But if somebody's willing to take this on, uh, understand that they have some symptoms that they want to tackle very seriously and completely, then cognitive behavior therapy is fabulous. And it's one of those therapies that insurance companies love because it's a cap of 15 sessions or so. And there's a wide evidence base suggesting that it works well for a variety of indications. And so there's a lot of win-win with this type of therapy if somebody can keep up with it and put in all the work. Now, I feel like I was tricked into doing cognitive behavioral therapy through my insurance provider. Like one of those wellness programs, and it's like, hey, you have to do something. And the only one that you could do without any effort was, um, it was called beating the blues and, uh, and it was online. So I didn't have to interact with anyone. So I was like, well, that's a good thing to do. Cause I don't want to have to talk to someone about my diet or drinking habits or anything like that. So I think it was cognitive behavioral therapy. Like, is that like online programs to do therapy now? Is that the thing? Well, because cognitive behavioral therapy is so prescribed and manualized, there are online versions of this or, um, uh, a manual you could buy at the bookstore or online to take on this therapy, doing it yourself. And there's also very highly trained professionals in this area. So it's a little bit, if you have a goal to get stronger or to lose weight and you say, well, I'm going to do it myself and I'm going to sign up to go to the gym and I'm going to do all these exercises and implement a nutrition program. The steps to do that are out there. And if you access those resources, read those books, do those websites, uh, great. Um, But many people find that they need help, like a physical trainer or somebody to help walk them through through the steps in order to increase the chances of their success. So that's where a CBT therapist comes in, or if it's a particularly complex presentation. And let me just say, I'm very sorry that you felt tricked into doing something by your insurance company. Well, it got got me a break on my deductible. So it was worth it, but I didn't enjoy it. (laughs) Yes. Is cognitive behavioral therapy something where someone without a lot of mental health issues, I'm not necessarily saying that's myself, but would find these techniques to be, well, no, of course, I don't think I'm a worthless person. Like, or no, I don't think my um, boss, you know, slighted me because I'm a bad person or something like that. Like, someone whose mind already doesn't uh, go to those places as naturally? Well, cognitive therapy, cognitive behavior therapy can be used for anything that you want to change to line up more with reality. So um, like you said, maybe you don't think you're a worthless person or, you know, that your boss is taking things out of taking things out on you. But there may be things that you believe day to day that represent a distortion. And so like my muscle size or <laughs> So a common distortion might be, you know, I'm not qualified to, to climb the job ladder at my work or something like that. And cognitive behavior therapy is not about brainwashing. So it's not about convincing an individual of something that's not true. It's about systematically assessing what is the truth and gathering evidence to establish the truth in order to 
shift your brain patterns to be more in line with what is actually the truth versus what your brain automatically does based on old stuff you're carrying around with you. So, and then dialectical, we haven't gotten there yet. Dialectical, dialectical, that's an interesting uh, word. It's a bit of a mouthful, but really cool story behind dialectical behavior therapy. There is a PhD trained experimental psychologist named Marsha Linehan, who was trained in radical behaviorism and also some uh, forms of cognitive behavior therapy and actually received her PhD in that area. And her heart really went out to those patients and clients that were suffering with severe suicidality and self-harm and almost considered lost cases to the rest of the medical and psychiatric field because their symptoms were so severe. And she thought, I really believe in behaviorism. I believe in cognitive behavior therapy. If we can just apply these treatments to this population, we can achieve some meaningful symptom improvement and move on. And she tried that with some very ill patients in the Seattle area, and it actually didn't work, and it, and it wasn't enough, and patients continued suffering. And so she scoured the literature from east to west to find anything behind it with an evidence base to say that it works. So she took ideas from Buddhist philosophy. She took ideas from assertiveness training in the 70s on how to how women were taught to negotiate in the workplace setting. You know, so you name it, if it's evidence-based and shown to help somebody suffering with something, she collected them in a manual and applied this protocol to these patients in Seattle. It's this manual with these different things to teach the patient and different things for them to try. But the neat thing about it is there's also these principles of interaction. So Dr. Linehan was really successful at interacting with these patients in a really sort of mysterious way. And we know why that is now, because she had actually been one of these patients in her early years, mm-hmm. hospitalized in the inpatient for a long time in her early adulthood and came out of that on her own, really, with uh, not a lot of help from the psychiatric or medical community who considered her somewhat of a lost cause. And so through her personal story of resiliency, she knew that recovery from this kind of situation was possible. And so she was undeterred in finding a solution for what worked, but also had this amazing ability to interact with these patients in a way that was very therapeutic, helped them to regulate their emotions and calm down. And so the lab that she worked with actually coded these behaviors, actually watched what she did and how she interacted with them and put it into the protocol so that when somebody's trained in this dialectical behavior therapy, they know all the skills to teach, these evidence-based skills, but also interact with people in the way that Linehan did, which was so successful and really flipped this area of treatment on its head in the last 20 years. And the term dialectical comes from this idea that there are opposite truths existing simultaneously, which is Uh, a concept that patients with these kinds of issues sometimes have trouble understanding. You can both love someone and hate someone at the same time. Uh, For example, and dialectical behavior therapy helps somebody be at peace with that tension and come to a synthesis on those ideas rather than vacillating back and forth between ideas. So that's where that term dialectical comes in. So there's a manual. Yep. And it's still a behavior therapy. Yep. Yep. But it is a certain number of sessions again? Well, it's about a year. Oh, goodness. And uh, there's these skill skills groups that's more like actually a classroom because you're sitting with other participants learning these skills. It's not a type of group therapy where everyone's talking about their problems. It's more of a class. And then there's individual therapy once a week with a DBT therapist who's going through some of that cognitive behavioral uh, homework. So there is still a lot of homework involved. But the manner of interaction between the therapist and the patient is very important because they need to be interacting with the patient in the same way that Linehan interacted with the patients in a way that's successful. The other revolutionary thing about this therapy is the therapist or somebody on the team is available between sessions to help with skills coaching. 
to help these skills generalize. Because it's one thing to learn the skill in a class, and it's another thing when you're at home at 4 a.m. and suicidal to apply them. You oftentimes don't have access to that information you learned in the class. And so a DBT therapist will have their phone number available to the patient. The patient can call and the therapist can help coach them in that situation to avoid something like a hospitalization or even a death. So there's evidence behind it? Absolutely. It's been studied and is now considered an evidence-based therapy. And it's continuing to be studied all the time to see if there's aspects that can be added or eliminated to make it easier to train in. And very soon, if not now, there'll be a certification through Linehan so that people can be uh, certified in this practice. Through Linehan, she's still, she's still around? Yep, she is. She's still working too? Like yep, she's, in she, Seattle. She's got a lab there. Okay. So she is she's, she's still in charge. Like, is she still the, the person? She's the developer of the therapy and she's trademarked the therapy. And uh, in the final, if not active phases of developing a certification. So it's very exciting. So right now, anyone could do DBT. Yep. There's uh, different um, standards that a clinic might say if, you know, if they would say if you're practicing DBT in our clinic, they want you to do it under this adherent model. Uh, but that's why it's exciting that this certification is coming out so that a consumer can really be informed on what the training is of the DBT therapist. Is it, is it the Wild West out there right now? Or what's the, I mean, because it, it sounds like it's still kind of being developed and she's still kind of working on a certification program. Like, how do I know I'm getting a good DBT therapist? I would, it's, I would say it's as much the Wild West as any other types of therapy. I mean, you have to ask your questions to see if somebody's adherent to uh, what's been shown to be evidence-based or if people t- put their own creativity or their own ideas into it. But a good way you can find out if something is adherent to Lena Hansen's model, you could ask, do you have a weekly skills group? Do you have individual DBT therapy where you complete a diary card or that homework I mentioned? And uh, are the therapists involved in a DBT consultation group, which meets weekly, which is one of the requirements? And is phone coaching provided? And if the answer is yes to all of those questions, uh, you're probably dealing with uh, a program that practices in a manner that's adherent with Linehan's evidence base. So how do people know which therapy is right for them then? That's a great question, and it might take a conversation with a primary care provider to find out what's best, or it might just come up to what's local and what's covered by insurance. So that's a really good place to start, but if you have the luxury of choosing between different types of psychotherapy, you can listen to this podcast and kind of get a sense of, well, am I dealing with grief or adjustment or mild symptoms, then supportive psychotherapy might be just right. If you're sort of higher functioning and wondering about what makes you tick and looking at taking your functioning and well-being to the next level, then psychodynamic psychotherapy might be for you. If you have a very specific task you want to accomplish, like addressing depression symptoms, anxiety symptoms, obsessive compulsive disorder symptoms or PTSD related symptoms or anxiety uh, in a straightforward manner than cognitive behavior therapies for you. And if you're somebody who has chronic suicidal thoughts or self-injury or really difficult time regulating your emotions and feel that you're in survival mode day to day, then if you have access to dialectical behavior therapy, that can also be a nice choice. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Kaz. So what's what are we going to talk about next week? Next week, we're hoping to expand our format a little bit. We want to talk a little bit about hot topics and mental health, things that are coming through Twitter and the media. And then I'd also like to spend a little bit of time answering the question, what's the deal? And then we also want to spend some time answering your questions in the third part of our time together. So be sure to send us your questions over Twitter. At Mind Deconstruct. That's right. Thank you for joining us today. This podcast was produced by Kaz and George. Music by Paul. He's the best. Contact us and send us your questions on Twitter at Mind Deconstruct.